Coming up on Tech News Today, Microsoft brings music to Xbox, but is it a cheap ploy to get you to buy Windows 8? Also, Japan's SoftBank buys Sprint, and millions of people watch a spaceman fall to Earth and land on his feet. All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Monday, October 15th, 2012. Tech News Today is brought to you by GoToMeeting with HD Faces by Citrix, the powerfully simple way to meet and collaborate with colleagues and clients from anywhere. You can share the same screen and see each other face-to-face -face with HD video conferencing, even from an iPad. Sign up for your 30-day free trial today. Visit GoToMeeting.com, click on the Try It Free button, and use promo code TNT. And by Ford, featuring available sync. Now you can control your media player with simple voice commands. Enjoy your drive while you easily search and listen to your favorite songs. Check it out on the 2012 Ford Focus and at Ford.com slash technology. And by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your iPhone, iPad, MacBook, or Android smartphones. Find out what your gadget is worth and get cash to upgrade to the latest iPhone at Gazelle.com. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Maya Zachter. And I'm Jason Howell. And this is the show where we all have taken a side in the Major League Baseball playoffs and keep you up to date in the tech news stories with the top 10 stories of the day in the news feeds. Microsoft is trying to beat all the music services and nudge you onto Windows 8 and Windows Phone at the same time. Tall order there. Xbox Music Service for Windows 8 allows free streaming with ads, as well as Pandora-like radio stations, and the ability to purchase songs. For an extra 10 bucks a month, the premium service allows offline ad-free listening. Cloud storage and a matching service are supposed to follow next year. The service will be available starting Tuesday to Xbox 360 Gold subscribers, and then follow on Windows 8 and Windows RT tablets and PCs, as well as Windows Phone 8 when those products launch. SoftBank is indeed buying Sprint, the third largest wireless carrier in the U.S., for $20.1 billion. And SoftBank is calling the new company the new Sprint. After the deal goes through, SoftBank will own about 70% of the fully diluted shares of new Sprint, which will own 100% of the shares of Sprint. It all makes sense to them anyway. SoftBank <laughs> says that the combined company will be the world's third largest in terms of revenues. Dan Hess will remain the CEO of New Sprint. It'll be new, Dan Hess. <laughs> According to news site Calicist, uh, Amazon is in advanced talks to buy the mobile chip business of Texas Instruments. Now, last month, TI said it would put its mobile processor business up for sale as it dealt with declining revenue. Of course, neither company has made any official statements on the matter. Eben Upton, founder of the Raspberry Pi Foundation, said users have been asking for a more expensive version of the Pi with more RAM. So he half listened. You can now get a Raspberry Pi with 512 megabytes of RAM, double the previous 256, but you won't pay more. The price stays at 35 bucks. Legal sources tell The Guardian that Google will be told to unravel the changes that it made to the European privacy policy back in March. The French Data Protection Commissioner, the CNIL, will hold a press conference tomorrow, announcing that together with the data protection chiefs of the other European Union countries, they have determined Google's changes breached EU law because it did not give users a chance to opt out. By putting the CNIL in charge of this, the EU was going for blood, says privacy expert Chris Watson. It was a declaration of intent. Yeah, Google blood, a very unknown property. <laughs> Windows 8 is around the corner, so that means we're seeing a lot of new hardware. Acer introduced a couple of new all-in-one PCs, including the 27-inch Aspire 7600U. It'll cost 1900 bucks. has some nice specs like a touchscreen, 8 gigabytes of RAM, Blu-ray, a dedicated NVIDIA GeForce GT640 graphics card. But there's one strange thing about this one. It runs on Intel's Core i5 mobile CPU instead of a desktop version. That's odd. Uh, Sony also joined the parade of PC makers announcing their Windows 8 computers that'll come out October 26th. Uh, most of the Sony line is your typical fare with some touch screens added in here and there. Of note are the Vio Duo 11, which is a convertible Ultrabook tablet starting at $1,100, and the Tap 20, that's the all-in-one desktop that can lie flat on a table by collapsing down. That one starts at $880.
In news that Captain Obvious himself would be proud of, Samsung's component supplier partnership with Apple is not going that well. This is according to a report in the Korea Times. Samsung currently makes Apple's newest A6 chip, which is used in the iPhone 5, but the relationship between the two companies has started to sour like month-old milk. So who's going to replace Samsung? Well, the report says Apple may co-sign future A7 chip production to Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, TSMC, the world's largest contract contract chip manufacturer. Easy for you to say. Yeah. Uh, you want to get people to watch live web TV? Apparently, all you have to do is go up to the edge of space and jump until you land on your feet. Uh, Felix Baumgartner broke things like the sound barrier, the record for highest free fall, but he also broke the record for simultaneous viewers on YouTube with estimates of more than 8 million. Now, besides showing dolphins just how superior humans are, Baumgartner's jump also collected invaluable data for developing emergency evacuation systems for orbiting vehicles. Notch has posted a video test of his next game, 0 times 10 to the C, online. Notch told PCGamer.com that the goal is to have it to feel a bit like Firefly. The game allows players to modify the programming of their spaceship. Notch says he's trying to design the game so you don't have to know programming, but you can share code. The game, which is still in pre-alpha, doesn't have a multiplayer uh, function yet, but Notch says he'll add it as soon as it's fun. This episode of Tech News Today brought to you by Go to Meeting by Citrix. I believe, as do most people, that if you want to be successful in business, you need to meet with your team regularly. You need to talk to them about stuff. Uh, and whenever you need to meet, wherever you are is a problem. Maybe you're not in the same place. Maybe somebody's off in their house. Maybe someone's across the country. Maybe someone's traveling on business around the world. That's why to discuss plans, share ideas, and bring them to life, your clients and colleagues can work in different offices and meet in face-to-face, real-time with GoToMeeting with HD Faces, the powerfully simple way to meet and collaborate with your team online. GoToMeeting with HD Faces gives your team the ability to share the same screen making it easier to see the same page. And when you meet face-to-face, -face, you're likely to see eye-to-eye. -eye. And I don't just mean that as kind of a funny phrase. When we use GoToMeeting with HD Faces here at Twit, you're actually able to see the reactions of people. You can kind of tell if they're getting what you're saying, if they're understanding, or if you need to explain a little more. It just makes business more effective. Try GoToMeeting free for 30 days. Don't wait. For this special offer, visit GoToMeeting.com, click on the Try It Free button, and use the promo code TNT. Be sure to use that promo code TNT. Go to meeting. Meeting is believing. And we thank Citrix and Go to Meeting for their support of Tech News Today. Well, we're all, uh, for those of you on the audio podcast, wearing the hats of our respective teams. Coursera Lane is a San Francisco Giants fan. That's right. Um, I myself, uh, I don't know, I have a problem with the Giants, but I grew up a St. Louis Cardinals fan. They're always my number one team. I, as uh, to rebel against your brother, you, you, yeah, you, you were a Yankees fan. They sucked in 1986. So. And so that left us needing a Tigers <laughs> fan, and Jason uh, ooh, volunteered. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> uh, uh, but your wife's from Detroit? Yes, exactly. Hey, okay, we so follow Detroit sports. So I yeah, thought it's a legit it worked. fan all right. I mean, I mean, my team right now in the NFL, fell is the Detroit Lions. They're not doing so great. They're okay yesterday. Lions but I might as well side with the with the Detroit. All right, so there yeah. we go. So we're Looking all represented. Uh, and as an impartial observer, joining us today to actually discuss technology <laughs> news, Mike Hurley, <laughs> co-founder, host, and executive producer of the 70 Decibels Podcast Network. If you haven't checked out 70decibels.com, they got great stuff over there. I was uh, It was kind enough, Mike, uh, for you to have me on your show a while back. It was a lot of fun. It was. Thank you very much for joining me, Tom. Oh, excuse me, and thank you for having me on today. And thanks uh, for uh, going along with our silly American baseball hats. It's my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry we don't have an appropriate neutral hat for you, but, you know, it, it'll be fine. Let's start Let's start talking about this uh, Xbox Music launch, IS. Sure, Microsoft made Xbox Music official today, and it's going to launch tomorrow, and it's going to be pre-installed on all Windows 8 and Windows Phone 8 machines. And if you're wondering what the service is like, it's going to be a, a bit like the uh, Zoom Music Pass, but with some extra features. You can buy individual tracks, stream music. There's a Pandora-like uh, radio option. 30 million tracks total, access to approximately 70,000 music videos. Uh, you can create playlists, and they'll be synced across devices when you log in. So there'll be a cloud function there. You can send music from your Windows 8 device to, to your 360. Pricing, there's it's free with ads, and that's only on Windows 8. That's going to be available in 15, uh, 15 markets. Free streaming, limited to 10 hours per month after six months. Now. And, and the big ads is screaming, unlimited, unlimited. And then there's little three asterisks on the Microsoft site that says... For six months. For six months. And it'll change to 10 hours. After that, you have to pay $10 a month for unlimited play. Pay per song gets you a 256 uh, kilobit per second. DRM-free, MP3. And that's going to be available in 22 markets. 
And if you're a Zune subscriber, you can get it tomorrow. But if you're a Windows 7 user, you get continued access to Zune Music. The client on Windows 7 and on Windows Phone 7 won't change. It'll still be Zune, which means you don't get cloud functions and you don't get access to free streaming. So you're kind of, Microsoft's kind of pushing this idea that if you go to Windows 8, you'll get this stuff for free. Uh, just kind of curious about, you know, around the, going around the horn, what's your opinion of Microsoft's treatment of Windows 7 users with Xbox Music? Because they've relabeled ex effectively Zune Music Pass, and they're saying everybody else should upgrade because you're not going to have the same functionality if you don't switch. Mike, what do you think? I think this is the start of Microsoft trying to do an Apple. They're, they're trying to cut off the old users now, um, and they're trying to entice people over to the new system because for Microsoft, it's all about Windows 8 and the Metro stuff. So if they're saying, oh, by the way, you don't have to pay for Spot Spotify or audio anymore, just come over and get free music on Windows 8. Yeah, I noticed uh, Patrick Delahanty uh, on Twitter uh, pointed out Apple tried this with iTunes, right? Remember when iTunes first came out, it came out on OS X, not on Windows. And when the iPod first came out, it could only be managed uh, via OS X, not Windows. And they, I don't know how successful that was. Eventually, they had to capitulate and say, well, we need everybody else. On the other hand, Microsoft says, well, everybody uses Windows, and people are likely to want to upgrade, and we're going to get a, people, a lot of people buying new computers that will just come with Windows 8. So maybe they have a better chance of actually pulling people in for this service, but I also... I also think that it's going to upset a lot of Windows 7 users like me. To where I'm like, I, I'm actually going to upgrade to Windows 8, so I guess I won't be upset. And maybe that's what they're counting on. Uh, yeah, but, I mean, you're you're not really upset because you're yeah. like, eh, it's not a big deal. I'm upset right now because I'm like, <laughs> wait a minute. I have to. If uh, I wasn't I was upgrading, upgrade anyway. then I'd be left out it's in the, the cold. It's the principle of but upgrade, I am. damn it. Yeah. It's also the six months is kind of interesting to me because when you look at actually what the pricing would be, it's free with ads. Okay, well, if you don't want ads um, and you want unlimited play after six months, it's 10 bucks a month. That's that's competitively priced, but it's not a better deal than what I'm already paying another streaming music service right now. Six months is just long enough for someone after six months to go, what? Oh, shoot. This is part of my life now. I guess I got to pay $10 yeah. a month. It's not that much. Plus, they're going after everybody. Nobody has all these pieces together, and I think that's what's most impressive about this uh, is you can you can do a Spotify subscription, you can do a Pandora type station, and if the match I, when the matching service comes, it, which they promise is coming next year, that's the icing on the cake. Is now I can upload everything that I have on my hard drive into the cloud, use it across my devices, but I can't use it across all my devices. However, they said. We're going to have an iOS and Android app. So once that happens, and it doesn't matter what device I have, then I think this is compelling. Mike, I'm kind of curious about your opinion when it comes to the fact it's called Xbox Music. IGN had this great piece up saying Xbox Music is useless on Xbox. That's the, the headline. Because, because it's going to cost you 180 bucks to get access. $60 for Xbox Live Gold. $120 for the music per year. Windows 8, again, is the only one that gets it for free. You can't get free streaming on Xbox unless you pay this money. The fact that it's being labeled Xbox Music, Mike, what do you think about that? I think that it's very smart by Microsoft to call it Xbox because they're leveraging the real popular brand that they have. Um, but as you say, I, as, uh, as the IGM report says, for an Xbox user, it becomes a very, very expensive proposition. So at that point, they may actually have a problem uh, with branding. Because, you know, when they had the Zune stuff, it was kind of separate. So people would accept it as the music thing. But with it being Xbox, while that's a great media brand, um, you actually could end up upsetting a massive potential core of their market. And really, this should just be a system that they offer for free on Xbox as well. I don't understand why it's free on Windows 8, but not on the Xbox. It seems very peculiar mm -hmm. to me. Yeah, they, they do tend to sort of assume that everyone just pays for gold. It's like Amazon Prime, right? Well, you're paying for Amazon Prime for the shipping, so we'll give you all this free video streaming. Well, you're paying for Xbox Live Gold because you want to play online games, right? So we'll we'll throw in this other stuff. They kind of forget that some people are like, no, I, I don't pay for Xbox Live Gold. Well, then Microsoft's going to say, don't worry, you can send songs from your Windows 8 device to your 360. Nah, so just get a Windows yeah. 8 device and send it for free. Just live in the Windows universe. Windows, Everything Windows, Windows. Everything will be fine. Uh, as we talked about last week, SoftBank is going to purchase Sprint, uh, $20.1 billion to acquire 70% stake uh, in the new Sprint. Uh, wait for classic Sprint to be put back on the shelves, though, I'm telling you. Uh, expected to close sometime mid-2013 after regulatory approval. As Sarah mentioned, it's kind of a, a really complicated deal. <laughs> Essentially, 
the best I can tell, SoftBank is buying 55% of Sprint's outstanding shares for $12.1 billion. That's $7.30 a share. Then SoftBank is giving Sprint $8 billion of cash, and the remaining 45% of Sprint's stock is converted into a stake in the new Sprint. It's kind of similar to what OnLive did. They're creating a new Sprint company, and 45% of the current Sprint stock is converted into a 30% stake in the new Sprint stock, leaving SoftBank owning 70% of the new oh, Sprint. Oh, well, thank you for clearing that up. I know, right? Clear as mud. <laughs> but the, uh, the, the ultimate end of this is SoftBank will now rank third behind Verizon and China Mobile globally as a mobile carrier. That's, and they'll be roughly tied with AT&T, a little bit ahead of Vodafone and NTT Docomo. That's what SoftBank gets out of it. They, they want this kind of leverage. It's obviously going to help Sprint with a cash infusion. Sprint gets some leverage in buying devices. Uh, they, can, they can strike better deals to get hardware for, because they'll have this global presence now with SoftBank behind it. And SoftBank CEO Masayoshi Son uh, said U.S. customers pay highest average monthly fees, but their average speeds are slower than Japan, Italy, and U.K. He said, every time I come to the United States, I say, oh, my God, the mobile phone network is so slow. So apparently he wants to help speed things up in the U.S. I think that's a that's a good value proposition to throw out there in front of potential customers. But, Mike, you're in the U.K. I want to get your uh, your read on him saying that average speeds are slower in the U.S. than the U.K. Is that your experience? Well, Masayoshi-san must not be counting 4G in this because we don't have it. So if he's looking at the average across all uh, data speeds, then he's definitely wrong. Um, with 3G speeds, I mean, I've spent time in the US, I've spent time here. The only places I've ever had um, trouble with are, are sort of high traffic areas, so big cities. Uh, but that's the same as in, as in the UK as well. I mean, I haven't, I don't really think that we have um, a, a much more advanced 3G network and we won't have 4G, any 4G coverage until at least the end of this month. Um, and that's on one network. So I, I think that he may he may just be talking it up a little bit. I you know I I think you're right. I think I think he's trying to make it look a little worse than it is. Maybe to 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 show how Sprint now can roll out LTE faster, get higher average speeds, and they could say, look what we did. But I think it's it's fair to say in Japan they gener it's generally assumed that Japan has really good mobile speeds and really good mobile coverage. Smaller area, but anybody disagree with that? I don't know. I saw the quote and I just thought I thought of the, the reverse. I'm like, what if he wants to make things slower everywhere else and get the bills up higher? Because that seems like a great plan. Because in the United States, we're paying a lot of money. We have a really slow uh, uh, coverage area. But if, if Sprint wants to actually become a leader in the long run, they do need to offer something different. And right now, their different thing is unlimited, right? That's the only, I think, believe it's the only carrier left, a major carrier that gives you unlimited data and unlimited talk time, all this other. They said that's, the, they didn't say anything about that going away. Right. So. And if they can, if they can somehow compete with Verizon's coverage area, that's the other thing. Like right now, LTE, if you think LTE, you think Verizon, because they've got everywhere, at t slowly building out. Yeah, Sprint's in 24 cities, Verizon's in 240. Yeah, I think, I thought Verizon's beyond that. It like may they're be hitting more, the smaller yeah. ones. So like that, so I don't know if, I don't know what kind of timetable they're looking at. I don't know if SoftBank's going to throw enough money at this or if Sprint's going to have enough money to compete in speed. It's going to have to be in some other way. I can't think of what it would be right now. I mean, Sprint has been crying duopoly for a long time now. We can't compete. How could we possibly? Uh, Verizon shouldn't be allowed to buy, you know, T-Mobile and or is it AT&T. Um, so, yeah, I mean, with this... With, with with some cash and the new Sprint uh, Corporation being created, I, I mean, I'd love for them to be able to uh, compete a little bit more evenly so that they don't have to fall back to, we can't possibly compete because it's an unfair market here in the U.S. And hopefully consumers will be the ones that uh, benefit the most. And uh, SoftBank has experience doing this. They have they 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 claim they've they fought against duopolies three different times. They've turned around three different businesses. Uh, their fixed line business in Japan, Vodafone KK, Vodafone Japan, uh, they took over and and have made a success. And Wilcom, which I don't know much about, but they claim, oh, we turned Wilcom around too. So this is sort of their thing, uh, is to to be number three, but become a strong number three. And he did say, like, I would like to become number one. It's the goal. It's the goal to get there. I think this is good for SoftBank globally. They get a lot of leverage. They get some spectrum uh, in the United States that they can use to bargain with. Uh, and it's great for Sprint. Uh, they get some cash. They get some backing. They can actually aggressively go after AT&T and Verizon now. And 
it's not bad for Clearwire. Apparently, there was a lot of rumors that Clearwire uh, would have to be sold off because uh, Sprint owns a, a large share of Clearwire right now. But they don't have to take any action with Clearwire after this. And in fact, they hinted that they would like to cooperate with Clearwire further in the future. Clearwire's LTE is the same kind of LTE, TDLTE, that is used by SoftBank in Japan. So there's a little bit of a synergy there as well. Let's, uh, let's talk about Felix Baumgartner jumping out of space and landing on his feet. So first of all, did we all watch this yesterday? Oh, yeah. The first half I got to watch. You for, okay, so you didn't actually see the cool part. Uh -uh. Oh, that's because the, the ascent was kind of The ascent was It's 121,000 feet, and I, my, my alarm goes off. I have to leave. Uh, did you watch it later, though? I did watch it okay. later. Yeah. So Jason, did you watch it? Uh, no, I've just seen the clips this morning. What I mean, I watched you, it later, but I didn't watch it last night, yeah. This is, I mean, for anybody watching the video uh, version, uh, the moment where he, I mean, he didn't really, like, do any crazy jump he just kind of let himself fall and it was very it was very dramatic i mean i'm watching <laughs> did you do it. a half gainer off there well, I don't, <laughs> just i don't know i don't know what i was expecting him to. to do well it's just it, you know you see the falling you know there's yeah there's no he did you, flip around in, in the vacuum there i mean you figure from so far out down. you don't know what's going to happen what's cool about this is this is his it looks like a helmet cam but you're actually seeing his helmet right there that's his head so it's more of sort of his chest looking up um, and <laughs> It'll make you dizzy if you're not careful. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this free fall is out of control. I mean, you really get a sense of how far up he is, you know, seeing the curvature of the earth. I mean, it just it freaks me out. I'm on Twitter. Ayaz and I were both, I was saying, you know, watching this is just like, boy, I would never want to do this. Really enjoying watching somebody else. And Ayaz was like, oh, I feel the opposite. I, I wish I was him. I want to do this. Gosh. But then I saw that the tumble he was doing, he was doing some spins. That was not intentional. And he almost died doing that. And like in the press conferences later on, apparently, oh, if man. he didn't correct his, uh, his uh, I guess his, his stance there, uh, he could have died. So he decided not to pull a shoot early because he's like, well, I might as well go for it. That's insane. So maybe I'm waiting for the 100,000. I think jump. when you're jumping out of space to the ground, you might as well go for it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, at this point, well, and there was this whole talk about how he, there was some... You know, heating issue with his with his helmet, mm -hmm. and it, it wasn't it wasn't uh, clear if he was even going to be able to jump once he got to you know 128,000 feet. I think that was about what he was at when he finally jumped. But one of the reasons that we're talking about this is because I broke a record. Eight million people watched the live stream. Um, YouTube says this is absolutely the largest number of concurrent live streams in YouTube history. And it streamed. It didn't go down for yeah, me. Yeah, it sure did. You know, when I woke up, because it was, uh, it was you know, morning time on Sunday uh, where I was, I, you know, I roll over, I, I look at Twitter to see if I'm missing anything. And sure enough, everyone's watching this guy because he's going up in the balloon. And he had been for a while, but he was only about halfway, halfway up at that point. So I thought, all right, well, I'll just click on one of the streams that I see in Twitter. And sure enough, I opened it on my phone. And I mean, until almost the very last minute where I was like, why don't I at least just watch this on my iPad, <laughs> see it a little bit bigger. I'm watching it on my phone, no problem. Didn't even, I, didn't even was, phase me. Eileen was watching it on the YouTube app on Google TV. And then she came out in the front room and I was like, I can't find it on TV. She's like, oh, it's on Discovery, but YouTube's streaming it. So I go mm -hmm. to Discovery, we're watching The Ascent, and then it goes to commercial. <gasps> and we're like, screw this, yeah. we're airplaying YouTube uh, to the big TV. Mike, did you get a chance to see it? I was actually in the cinema. I didn't know it was happening yesterday. I knew it was happening, but didn't know it was yesterday. And I left the cinema after seeing Taken 2. And uh, for as great as that movie was, I was very upset that I missed it. <laughs> did you go back <laughs> and uh, check it out later? Yeah, t Twitter exploded. That was how I knew. And then I uh, watched some YouTube videos and some amazing animated GIFs. Um, I saw a few people on Twitter saying they felt bullied into watching it. They're like, so many people on Twitter were so excited. They're like, fine, I'm going to watch it too. Well, that's not really bullying. That's yeah, momentum. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> that, it was pretty that's, impressive. That's getting swept up in excitement more than bullying. You know, what, what I enjoyed about the coverage on this, if you went to the Red Bull site itself, uh, they actually had, they had the, the embedded player for YouTube. But they had all these stats on the left and right and below it. So you didn't have to have all this stuff junking up the screen mm -hmm. while things were going on. I thought it was a nice way to use... You know the web and video at the same time instead of going with the old standard we're doing television on the web with giant things everywhere it was interactive data everywhere that was live updating instead of it clogging up the the screen so i really enjoyed looking at it on the red bull site because i'd seen other places embedded and they had all their other coverage around it but and so many people could, were watching it on phones you know it, yeah. yeah sure you could turn on discovery if you had cable at home and discovery's on most cable systems but if you're out and about you could watch this on your phone you could watch this in your car. I saw a couple people talking about it. It was one of those things where, I, I mean, obviously it's it's an amazing thing to watch, but it was 
it was really particularly very special to watch it live, and it didn't really matter. And like you said, the stream was great. They had all these different cameras. They were switching between the different feeds. You really got a sense of where he was. You hear um, the back and forth between him and Master Control. They're going through, okay, let's go to number four. All right, attaboy. I mean, it was really, really exciting. Well, uh, Kittinger, the guy who set the uh, previous record, was the main was the mission guy. control guy. Yeah, and you could tell Although, that he was. He I was, was so a little freaked out this. at the end when they're like, when he's like, I need direction. I need direction. They're like, wind's coming from the north. Wait, no, south. I'm like, yeah. no, you need to get that right. Yeah. That's important. Yeah. yeah, I think at one point they're like, east. East? Wait, wait no, wait. Oh, no, 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 no. Sorry. Sorry. Totally the opposite of east. Sorry. Can you hear us? <laughs> Are you passed out? Uh, oh. but what's, uh, Baumgartner reached a maximum velocity of Mach 1.2 which is more than 833 miles per hour, which is more than the speed of sound. That's so incredible. I don't even know what to say. Also, what's kind of cool is that his body was being monitored during this jump. This is unprecedented. Um, he was using equipment from a company called Equivital, Equivital, which is a UK company. Um, like you might be familiar with them. I was not, uh, which is basically a system that's strapped to his chest, transmitting data about his heartbeat, uh, respiratory issues, skin temperature, vital signs, all that kind of stuff can be used for uh, emergency evacuation from spacecraft, for example, you know, in, uh, in, in future flights. So this was not just some sort of a stunt that ended up going really well. This is actually scientific data that you know, we can use um, for future space play. Yeah, for space tourism, space exploration, uh -huh. yeah. space industry. All right, let's take a quick break. This episode of Tech News Today brought to you by Sync from Ford, featuring Sync's versatile entertainment features like browsing. You can browse your music collection by genre, album, artist, playlist, or song title, all using voice commands. Playlists. Sync allows voice-activated control of your media player. It'll even play a list of music you're in the mood for with the Play Similar Music voice command. Listen to your entertainment on most any device. Voice control music, no matter how it's stored. You got it on a smartphone? Bluetooth streaming, USB drive, plug it in. MP3 player, iPad, iPod, whatever. They also do iTunes tagging. You don't have to worry about remembering the name of a great song you just heard. Available sync with my Ford Touch and HD radio technology with iTunes tagging. Let you tag a song you like, transfer that into your iPod, and purchase the song directly from iTunes store at a later time. Best of all, Ford offers sync on every 2012, 2013 Ford vehicle sold in the United States, including the 2012 Ford Focus. Want to learn more about this and other technologies Ford is bringing to its vehicles? They got a ton of great stuff. Go check it out. Ford.com slash technology. And we thank Ford for their support of Twit and Tech News Today. Sarah, uh, we, were to, we were looking at this story on The Atlantic about dark social. Does this mean... <laughs> Twittering in the dark, <laughs> with the lights off. You with, know, it's, it's I'm scared. I'm frightened of the dark. What it's, is this? It's funny when you mentioned you were like, "Hey, have you looked at this story?" Because of course, Tom knows that you know it's social stories uh, specifically. I'm, I'm usually interested in, and I I actually um, was confused by the term dark social. To me, it was like, "Ooh, somebody's hacking into my Facebook." Like a dark net. Yeah. yeah right, so okay. I didn't really understand. Or a dark uh, tipper. <laughs> or the dark tip, yeah, all that stuff. You know, just people doing bad things socially. Alexis Madrigal um, over at The Atlantic wrote this story. Um, dark social is a term that he coined to represent basically a chunk of traffic coming to a site that isn't being shared places that we are all told things are shared socially, like Twitter or Facebook. It's uh, links that are being shared via um, an instant message conversation or coming from a secure site, you know, HTTPS. Um, then in my stats, I see that somebody came to my blog, but I'm not exactly sure where they came from, from an email distribution list, all of those places that are actually really, really hard to track. He says that's that's the dark social area. So when you look at your stats, if, you've, if you're running a blog or any sort of a website where, uh, where people are coming from, where, um, where, where links are coming in from is really important to you, this is that data that's just really hard to muck through. What we're looking at now is actually a chart uh, made by the folks over at Chartbeat. They're a real-time web analytics firm. And he says, Alexis says, you know, they had a, uh, a meeting with the Chartbeat folks over at the Atlantic. And without him even explaining his whole theory about dark social and how people should uh, care more about why uh, this is not, uh, it's not very readable, Chartbeat explained, hey, you know what we're doing with our, uh, with our services? We're gonna split visitors now 
visitors that don't have referred data into two categories. So there are the people who go to a homepage, like theatlantic.com, or a specific page like theatlantic.com slash politics. Or there are the other folks who go to any specific page that just follows some sort of a link that has a complicated string, you know, to a certain permalink page. No one's really ever typing in those long strings. Right, because the, when somewhere. they have no refer, you assume, oh, they must have typed it in themselves. But that's very unlikely. But on a long URL, they didn't. Yeah. They got it somewhere else. That's highly unlikely. Chartbeat is actually calling all of these people direct social. So it's very much like dark social. It's pretty much the exact same theory. They're just calling it something different. What's interesting is that uh, the Atlantic folks uh, made use of Chartbeat's direct social capabilities. And when you look at that chart again, Jason, I don't know if you can bring it up again, yep. over half of their traffic is coming through this way. This is traffic that's not coming through uh, via any of the any of the obvious uh, referrals. So 21% coming from Facebook, 11% coming from Twitter, 56.5% coming from people sharing links with each other probably, mm -hmm. but not through any social service that can be tracked. Yeah. It's email. It's IM. And it's, you might say, well, maybe the Atlantic is just an anomaly. Uh, Chartbeat says, no, no. If you look across broader media properties, almost 69% of social referrals tend to be dark. Facebook's more at about 20%. Twitter's only six. So, you know, the takeaway from this to me is not, oh, well, social isn't working. It's just... You know, keep in mind, if you've got people who are managing a Facebook page or making sure that any time a reporter uh, publishes a new story that you've got that up on the Twitter account, that's all important. But that's not the way that people are sharing your content. Just because you can't track it doesn't mean they aren't sharing it. Right. And this is why I really, really hate it when sites embed their links when you copy their headline. <laughs> yes. Because oh, it's annoying and they don't, there's no way to feedback that, right? There's no like drop in referral rates for that kind of a link. Uh, and so, so it just, there's no way to tell them like, stop doing that. You're just annoying the people who are trying to share the links for you, for you, because you're forcing them to do it in a way that's just, that's just awful. I was looking at this article and looking at those those numbers. It just makes me think about how people actually want things to be seen. Because like when I want to put something up and I kind of want people to see it, Twitter, Really good way. But if I want, like, Sarah, do you, do you see something? I'll, I'll either IM it to you or I'll email you because I want you to see it directly. Mm -hmm. Because that's the kind of thing where if it's really important, that's what you want to do. You just want to be like, oh, did you see it on my, on my Twitter stream? Like, it was, like, over there, like, after those five at replies with this other thing. Like, it gets lost in these kinds of streams. So it's interesting to see that so much traffic is going that way because it's, like, the almost the old way of sharing. You used to just... It, uh, emails and I guess IMs. what this shows is it's not the old way of sharing, the, but the old way just has kept going. I guess that's that's a good way to categorize that. Yeah. To me, it was I thought I thought that was going away because social networks. I'm like, yeah, post it there, but for direct direct viewing, it's a lot easier to send emails. Well, that's Madrigal's point in writing this is to point out like, hey, we we're forgetting that the way the web worked in the '90s still works, and people still use it that way. Mike, what do you make of this? I, I'm a little concerned that if it becomes a, a buzzword, we'll try and get dark social analysts. We'll try. <laughs> That's a very fair point. And, and now if it becomes, because really you can't track this, that there aren't, I don't think our tools are sophisticated enough because the tools that are being used to share this stuff are very old. Like they, they're not built for this sort of social sharing because it wasn't something that I don't think was really considered too much at that point like it is now. So then my other concern is that IM clients might start building some sort of tracking stuff in. And it, I just hope that it's something that, well, okay, it's great that we know about it, but we're just going to forget about it now. Yeah, or we'll see all kinds of extra crazy stuff after the question mark. If you ever have copied a URL out of an RSS feed, you know that there's all this tracking information to show, oh, they clicked on it from the RSS feed. Mm -hmm. So dark social may actually be even larger than we thought, since a lot of those clicks may get tracked as if they were coming from the place that they got copied from, like an RSS reader. Hmm. Uh, but I thought this, I, I like you, Sarah, I thought this was really, uh, really interesting that you know what? The more things change, the more people still use the web the way it was originally intended. So well, and what he, the point he also makes too is that he says we've sort of we've been hearing for a while. We now have to get give up our personal data um, in order to have the ability to share links with friends, right? And people kind of go, ah, that's the trade off. And some people got a problem with Facebook, and this is this is a struggle that a lot of people have. He says that's not really happening though, because yeah. we can share however we want. 
we're exchanging our personal data in exchange for the ability to publish and archive a record of our sharing. A lot of this stuff is more of just, it's that breadcrumb trail that I think is actually really fun about social. It's partly sharing with you guys, but it's partly me saying, here, on this day at this time, I liked this link. Yeah, let me, let me and see. And I can yeah. go back and find it easily somewhere. It's it's more about record keeping and, and wide sharing than mm -hmm. like, hey, Sarah, I want you to take a look at this thread. Yeah. You know? Uh, Apple reportedly reducing their role uh, or reducing the role of Samsung in the production of their chips. Korea Times reports that uh, Samsung official told them Apple Samsung's relationship is unraveling that uh, with the A6 chip, the most recent chip, Samsung was reduced to being just a foundry to print out the chips that in the past Samsung used to collaborate a little bit on the design, but Apple shut them out entirely this time. Uh, the quote from the Samsung official, unnamed Samsung official, is Apple has made it clear it will no longer use its rival's technology uh, and that they were uh, will move the A7 chip to be manufactured by Taiwan's TSMC. That company was rumored to take on the A6, but they didn't. It may be that they weren't ready to take it on, and that's why Apple just limited Samsung's involvement. Uh, flash and memory chips for the iPhone and the iPad, also made by Samsung. And reports have indicated Apple would like to diversify its source portfolio for those parts as well. Now, a lot of people have claimed that's because of supply, that they need so many of these parts that Samsung just can't put them all out. And so they want a, a wider supply chain. But Park Young, a senior analyst at Tongyang Securities, says it appears that Samsung is losing its multi-billion dollar partnership as Apple has been its biggest parts client. They're making it up in volume with Samsung Galaxy S3 sales and things they build themselves. But are are we seeing... I mean, it's easy to look at the story and say, ha-ha, Samsung, Apple hating each other even more. And I think that's part of it. I think there is a bit of an emotional element to this that, that as Sarah pointed out in the news views, is kind of obvious that these two companies don't like each other. But it is, is it a further negative trend of isolationism where companies are, are kind of saying, you know what, we need to bring everything inside. I, mean, I, th I think Apple just wants to get the most profit on the hardware. Simple as that. If Samsung was the best deal, that's where they would go. But it seems like Samsung is the best deal for the A6 chips, and they're saying, yeah, no, we don't want, we don't care, we don't want you anymore. I would think that that could possibly be a long-term kind of negotiation strategy, saying, look, we went with TMS, TSMC instead. We went with this other company, other company. That way, they can go. No, we were serious. We weren't just bluffing this whole negotiation. We weren't saying. You guys can do a better deal for us. I'm thinking long term, they're going to go back to Samsung anyway because Samsung knows what it's doing when it comes to making these these chips. And the thing is, if Apple wants to maintain their well the supply for the demand, they need to make sure they have all these working relationships with all these different companies. As for Samsung not having the same uh, design uh, participation in the past, I mean, in this particular case, Apple's had PA Semiconductor for a long time. They've been working on their own chips for a pretty long time. So... For them to just say, look, this is what we want you to build. It's not that surprising to me because they, they like to control everything from end to end. Why would this be any different? Mike, what do you make of this? Uh, 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 is it just uh, obvious of Apple and Samsung's relationships breaking down? And this is one of those cases where uh, it, it it is a, sort of an attitudinal company relationship? Or does it just make sense for Apple to, to cut Samsung out because of purely business reasons? I mean, there could be business reasons, but I think this is a... A problem that Apple can have that they can sometimes, to a fault, be a little bit too emotional. Um, and I think that there is definitely a link here between the lawsuit. It's like, not only do you now owe, owe us untold billions of dollars, you're now not going to get any of that money back from our business as well. That's how it feels to me. Um, I am an Apple fan, but the, the lawsuit stuff, it always puts a bad taste in my mouth because they, they can be... Um, a bit like a child sometimes with some of the decisions they make when it comes to these sort of decisions. And Money2004 in the chat room uh, pointing out, don't forget that uh, Apple just hired a guy from Samsung, a chip designer, uh, who left Samsung to go work for Apple, who used to work for AMD. So it gets more and more interesting, the intrigue of the chip design business. Uh, let's finish up with some more chip news. Actually, Amazon, this kind of follows on talking to TI about buying its mobile chip arm. Again, another company's maybe wanting to bring things in-house. Yeah, and this report came from Calculus, uh, from the journalist Asaf Gilad, and he actually reported on Apple buying PA Semiconductor back when it was just a rumor. So this is this is, this guy has had a pretty good track record when it comes to this. Uh, the reports are Amazon's in advance talks to buy the chip business. Now, obviously, no company has said anything about this, and Texas Instruments makes the processors for the Kindle Fire HD, 
as well as the Barnes & Noble Nook, and a number of other phones. I, I believe the Gal one of the Galaxies has a TIO map in it for some reason. Uh, in late September, TI said they would sell its, uh, it would, it would sell its uh, mobile processors division. But would it make sense for Amazon to purchase its own chip arm, or, or should they just continue going out there? Because it, it, Amazon doesn't seem to do an end-to-end -end thing. They've been using reference designs, and they've been you know, using lots of different companies. Mike, do you think that Amazon should go with this kind of strategy and pick up its own chip business? I, as with you saying that they also provide them for the Nook, would suggest to me that potentially this is a, just a pure um, competition advantage piece from Amazon, where they don't, I don't think they need to own their own company yet. I don't think that they're producing potentially the, the volumes of, of products that would require them to open their own to, to own their own chip manufacturer but if they can constrain the resource of their competitors then it may be a good buy for them i could see this in addition to that being a uh, move similar to apple buying pa semi uh where they did they're not doing all of the things that pa semi did but they wanted to bring that design arm inside and amazon may say you know what we get to shut nook out of this uh, at the same time, we get to bring a lot of in-house expertise into designing the Kindle Fires of the future, uh, which could help us make a, a better machine and, and maybe gain some efficiencies in the supply chain. Yeah, but one of the reasons Texas Instruments was losing revenue over the over the years is because other manufacturers were effectively outdoing them. That's what that's what a lot of people are saying. That Nvidia designs are better. Would it make sense for Amazon to get something that's like okay, it's not the greatest thing, but well, it's if they ours. get it for cheap and they just use the knowledge and not try to get into the business, that that's why it makes sense. But the, but Nook would have to go find somebody else in that case There's anyway. Lots Nook of... and Nvidia, then they blow Amazon out of the water. Nook Vidia. Everything's so fast and begins with N. Fast e-reading. <laughs> I turn pages so quickly. <laughs> like I think as well, like. Something really changed for Apple when they started with the the A4 and things like that. That when they're designing from a hardware and a software perspective aligned, it did actually equate to a better product. So maybe Amazon have come under fire for the that wasn't a pun actually. They have come under <laughs> it was, but unintentional. <laughs> yeah, it, it, they've come under some harsh criticism for the the response and the speed of the fire. So if they can try and develop something in house, which is a more rounded solution then they actually may be able to create a better product out of it. Yeah, no, I think that makes perfect sense. You're right. All right, let's uh, finish off with some randomizer. Randomizer. Saturday Night Live did a skit on Saturday night about uh, chip design. No, it wasn't about chip design. Well, it was almost about chip design. So there's it was a little bit of that in there. It was actually about tech pundits criticizing the iPhone 5, and they had characters playing a CNET a Wired, and a Gizmodo reporter, mm -hmm. which got all of us here in the tech industry all excited because, like, ooh, look, we're being mocked. That's awesome. Uh, it was then they the, the the joke was that they were making, like, crazy complaints about the iPhone with the purple glare and the lightness and, and the scratching. I love, and then, I love one of them. He says, listen, we wanted a thinner and lighter phone, and this is thinner and lighter, but come on. This, this is, is ridiculous. ridiculous. Uh, I gotta, then I gotta they have to face that. three Foxconn employees who uh, basically the joke is that they're like, oh, you're so it's so sad for you that your iPhone has got a little problem uh, when we work under these horrible working conditions. A lot of people thought this was hilarious. They thought it was a great send-up of the technology industry. What did you I think? I didn't think it was that funny. Really? Yeah, so this is the sort and of... you're a big Saturday Night Live fan. I love so. SNL. I watch it every Sunday. I'm usually out, you know, partying on Saturday, so I can't be bothered. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I just prefer to watch it Sunday mornings on Hulu. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I heard about this on Twitter well before I actually saw the clip. And, in fact, people were writing tech articles just embedding the NBC video because they thought it was so relevant um, to the tech industry. And, yeah, I get it. But I just didn't think it was that funny. I also, I'm not crazy about the idea of dressing up like Chinese manufacturing workers and doing the accent. And it just doesn't quite work mm. for me. I, was, no, I, was watching, I saw it this morning. Like I saw it on Twitter already and I was like, ah, I don't want to watch this. I think it's going to, oh, it's a mainstream send up of iPhone stuff. It's going to be brilliant. It wasn't. It was like, oh, tech writers still sound like nerds from like the 1980s in a 1980s movie. They're like, well, we talk about the iPhone and blah. It's like Get really a little too close to home, huh? A little bit. Yeah, you because know, I always talk like this, and I'm like, why? Why are they constantly making fun? No, I was like, come on. I mean, we've seen writers from these companies. But it's a do parody. Uh, it was. It wasn't that 
funny. Mitt Romney and Barack Obama don't talk the way they talk in their characters on SNL either. It, it was it it's was more of the it's it's the continuation of an old old stereotype. Well, on both jokes, like you're you're Sarah's talking about like the the racial jokes, and mm. I'm talking about like the nerd jokes. I'm like, come on with this. They, the only thing they didn't do is put giant glasses on the writers. Christina Applegate's Veronica Belmont impression was very good though. <laughs> what did Mike? What did you think? Did you watch this? I am not able to, and um, for that we can blame Hulu. Ah, see, now there's the real problem. The real issue with this is geolocation. Uh, You've you could, been, uh, you could have used VPN, but that'd be a lot. You've of, been spared. A lot of trouble to go through just anyway. to watch that clip. Um, all right, well, let, let us know what you guys think. TNT at twit.tv. I thought it was mildly amusing. Maybe not. I thought it was, quite okay, as funny. yes, mildly yeah, amusing. I, I didn't need tech yeah. articles written, written about, about the skits. I'm, I'm with That's you there. That's where I draw the line. I would rather spend my time <laughs> making cash selling my old gadgets because that is a first world issue. Uh, you what? You want to get some uh, some new gadgets? You need some money for the from your old gadgets. You want that new iPhone? Before you get the new one, make sure you sell your used iPhone to Gazelle for cash money. It's simple. It's fast. It's hassle free. You go to Gazelle.com. G A Z E L L E dot com. Tell Gazelle the condition of your phone, even if it's broken. Be honest, sometimes they'll give you cash for that anyway. Uh, they do recycle responsibly over there, and sometimes they can fix stuff up. So go ahead, go there, tell them, tell them what shape it's in, tell them what you got, find out what your offer is, then lock that in, because the offer's probably not going to go up. Gadgets don't generally get more valuable over time. So lock that quote in for 30 days, then go get your new gadget. Once you got your new gadget, you can send them the old one, and you get your cash back quickly they can pay you by paypal or check payment is fast you get it within a few days i just sold my iphone last week once they got it they sent me an email saying hey we got it then they sent me an email saying we've checked it out you're gonna get your money a couple days later i had my money and though like i said those offers are good for 30 days find out what your iphone is worth take a minute go to gazelle.com and sell your used phone today we thank them for their support of tech news today g-a-z-e-l-l-e.com so I believe there's a calendar, Sarah. Do you know what's on it? You have been informed correctly, and I do. IBM and Intel have earnings reports tomorrow. That's October 16th. Oh, earnings season. Yay. It's going to be fun for some people. Every three months. Not others. GigaOM Structure Europe is taking place tomorrow through Wednesday in Amsterdam. Focus on cloud computing. Also tomorrow, running through Thursday, is TwilioCon or TwilioCon. I never know which one to say. I always say Twilio, but I don't know if that's I, right. I all I I remember it as the logo that looks a it's lot like the old Twi tech TV. That's a Twilight logo. convention. Totally. <laughs> Twicon is different. Oh, um, taking place in San Francisco. Focus on building with Twilio, which is uh, bringing voice and messaging to apps. Let's see what's incoming. Incoming message. Got an email from, I don't know who it's from, actually. Oh, Marlon. Marlon, guy from Trinidad. He says, I just listened to Friday's episode, and like Tom, I use Amazon when I search for the prices of products. However, it can have unsuspecting side effects. A month ago, I was checking the prices of cheap unlocked phones for a friend, and a couple of days later, this came in my mail. Uh, there's a link to an email from Amazon showing Merlin all kinds of deals on unlocked phones. <laughs> says, thought you might get a kick out of that. So they... They track you. You check your email preferences at Amazon.com <laughs> before, before searching. Good point. An email from George about Google TV. I was listening to your Friday show about Google TV version 3 and about how all audience members will be yelling at their TV screen. With Google's experience of voice recognition, I submit that Google will likely build in a microphone into their next remote. This remote paired with your television to receive commands to navigate the channels, search for TV shows and movies, etc. In fact, if you're listening, Google, you might want to think the term whisper search. That way you won't have to wake your wife or husband or kids when you're trying to search for Game of Thrones. Just a thought. Brian says, I remember a while back when Facebook announced sponsored posts where users could pay to have their posts pushed to the top of all their friends' news feed. I, like you guys, thought it was a laughable idea that someone would be so attention-starved that they would pay Facebook to have their friends read their posts. Well, promoted posts rolled out today, and as it happens, I'm trying to rent out one of my bedrooms and was already advertising that fact on Facebook, and it occurred to me that instead of just posting and hoping people saw my post, I could promote the post and make sure all of my friends saw it. For a mere seven dollars, it seemed like a good deal. If I can find someone I already know to live with instead of some random guy from Craigslist or a paper ad. You know, that's a really good point. Or what if you know uh, you lost your dog? Or you know, there's something where it's like, you know what, seven dollars is more than worth it. I want to make sure to my friends the, see to it. To get the word out, and if they're actually friends, then of course they'd be appreciative of that. There are definitely instances where it's not just like, ugh, self promotion. How annoying! You're ruining my news feed. Do you agree, Mike? I'm just scared that I'll see people 
who are attention seeking, who are just really sad <laughs> and just want, you know, just, or they've, they've put up a new picture and want everyone to tell them how beautiful they are. They're just so they going to, yeah, look at me, friends. <laughs> I keep it seven dollars every week. Well, there's unfriend. Well, you can unfriend them, right? But then that that entails all kinds of other social awkwardness. So uh, it is it is it is a thorny problem. That's it for this episode of Tech News Today. Thanks for submitting stories on our subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com. It's where you can go to let us know what kinds of stories you'd like us to cover on the show. Either submit the stories or vote them up or down. Mike Hurley, uh, thank you so much uh, for being on the show. Great to have you along. Great to hear your insights. Let folks know uh, where they can find more of your stuff. I'll tell them all about 70 Decibels. So uh, 70 Decibels is a podcasting network that is based um, in the UK. However, all of my hosts are pretty much from the United States. So don't worry if you are biased to not listening to these sorts of accents or if you can't understand me. Um, and you can find what we do at 70decibels.com. They're shows based you know, for technology people um, about tech and just general interest type stuff. A little bit of comedy chucked in there too. Good stuff. Go over and check it out. That's it for us today. Thanks, everybody, for watching or listening. You can find us on the web, twit.tv slash TNT. You can email us. Our email address is TNT at twit.tv. Or you can give us a call and leave us a voicemail. Our phone number is 260-TNT-SHOW, a free local call in Butler, Indiana. So give us a call and leave us a message. We'll see you tomorrow with an all-new Tech News Today. Go Giants! Go Cards. Thanks. Thanks for stopping by. Detroit!